Welcome, my name is Petra Butler and I'm delighted to chair round two of COVID-19 and international law, where my colleagues Alberto Costi, Susie Frankel, Joanna Mossop and Björn Oliver Maxek will discuss some of the recent international law issues that have arisen due to the COVID-19 pandemic. We will hear a short presentation from each of them, followed by some questions. And Alberto, I invite you to start. Many thanks, Petra, and welcome everyone. Uh, it is really important that to understand that the international law has really been at the core of some of the issues in the last few months about the, the COVID-19, and especially since our round for first round of discussion on the COVID, international, COVID and international law, there have been important issues and I want to really address two main issues in the limited time I have today. First is to deal with the relationship between the World Health Organization, WHO and its members. And then I would like to address the question of the resettlement of refugees who have been very much forgotten by COVID-19, uh, the French would say the grands oubliés of this pandemic. And hopefully if we have time for a third round later in the year, there's a number of more legal issues like state responsibility, participation of Taiwan in the work of intergovernmental organizations that could be very interesting to talk about. But in the limited time I have, I want to first turn on the relationship between the WHO and its member states, the member parties to the WHO. There's been a couple of issues in the last few weeks that have kept the WHO in the limelight. First, the decision of the United States to stop financing the activities of the, and the threat to leave the WHO altogether. And secondly, the call for an independent inquiry endorsed by New Zealand and over 100 20 other states at the recent WHO assembly meeting. Now, the absence of the annual US contribution to the budget of the WHO, about 15% of the total budget of the organization, would be really sorely missed and would really inquire, require an increase from other able states or from uh, private donors. The loss of the US influence on the organization the budget uh, gaps that it might create in the crucial role that is played by the WHO around the globe, and also critiques within the US from both sides, sides of the political spectrum, all could have serious political ramifications. But as a matter of international law, though, President Trump has not yet taken any legal action, despite its, his uh, thunderous tweets, his strong worded statements, that threatened to freeze permanently the funding of the WHO and to withdraw from the organization. So the first question, is it possible for the US to withdraw from the WHO? There is no provision to that effect in the constitution of the WHO. And in international law, Article 56 of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties does provide that there is, there, there is no unilateral right to denounce or withdraw from a treaty unless established by the parties uh, when they signed up, to, when they negotiated the treaty, or the possibility that it may be implied by the nature of the treaty. Uh, this did not prevent the, the US from walking out of UNESCO in the recent past uh, in the absence of objection from Congress, and Israel did the same. The difference here is that even if such a possibility exists, it could not happen before next year. And the US will have first to pay the balance of its contribution to the organization for 2020. So the, 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 this is a result of a resolution that was passed in 1948. In re response to the absence of a withdrawal clause in the WHO constitution, the Congress in a joint resolution stated or explicitly mentioned that the US reserved the right to withdraw on a one year notice and secondly, but first it had to ensure that the, it, the US met its, the full financial obligations it had towards the organization in the current fiscal year. And it is on that acknowledgement that the president at the time was acting under the authority and conditions of this joint resolution that the WHO assembly recognized the validity of the ratification 
by the US. So in fact, the last word will not will be the, the word of the incumbent, the one, the person will be president in November 2020 after the elections. The withdrawal cannot legally take place before mid-2021 and after having completed payment of the contribution of the US to the current fiscal year. Now, if I can turn briefly to my second point on the WHO, New Zealand has joined Australia and many other nations in a call for an independent inquiry into the outbreak of COVID-19. We know that Australia was one of the most vocal advocates of an independent investigation into the origins and the early handling of the coronavirus outbreak. And this obviously attracted a strong pushback from China, which claimed it was really a political game against Beijing. Finally, a motion was adopted, and it was after very much the work of some of the members of the European Union who ironed out some of the difficulties in the project of that motion. And in fact, this resolution that was adopted, and that included support by the UK, Russia, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, it calls for a systemic review of the world's response to COVID-19. And if I may just cite, I mean, it really calls on the Director General of the WHO to initiate a stepwise process of impartial, independent and comprehensive evaluation, including existing mechanisms to review the experience we've gained and the lessons that have been learned from the WHO coordinated response to COVID-19. And secondly, the process should be launched at the earliest appropriate moment in consultation with members of the WTO. The text was considerably modified to diffuse tensions and, and to get China on board because the president of China, Xi Jinping, made it clear that China would only support a WHO-led investigation with two conditions. It should happen after the pandemic is over and secondly, that it should focus on more than just looking at China's action. And, it is interesting that our Prime Minister, Jacinda Ardern, did say that it, it, New Zealand was backing such a resolution because it was sensible to learn the lessons of COVID-19, not to embark on a witch hunt. So in the absence of a real compliance mechanism under WHO constitution, such as a right of mission within territory of a member without its consent, all inquiries must be palatable to countries, to members, to China, for instance. So whether that may lead to a more robust early notification system as may be found in other treaties or has been hinted by international law experts such as Professor Don Rothwell at ANU, a change in reporting obligation, a specific agreement dealing with pandemics, it is too early to say. And, I, and that is quite important that it's an issue that it, it, it will not go away and will need to be discussed in more detail. Now, jumping very quickly to, my, to the discussion of resettlement of refugees, I, I really want to say that, uh, well, first of all, we know that New Zealand each year does welcome a number of UN refugees. To understand, UN refugees at, as opposed, or the, uh, the UNHCR, the UN, UN High Commission for Refugees, extends the definition of refugees to a wider number of, of asylum seekers than the 1951 Refugee Convention. In fact, the definition includes all those who are affected by indiscriminate effects of an armed conflict or other human-made disasters, people, persons who find themselves outside their country of origin, they are unable to return there owing to serious threats to life, freedom, physical integrity, or from general violence or events that seriously disturb public order. We know that the UN Refugee Agency halted all travel for refugees as international borders closed because of the COVID-19 pandemic. And with New Zealand borders closed to foreign nationals, refugees are unable to enter. We were already in the past financial year below the number of refugees we, UN refugees we accepted to resettle in New Zealand. And most likely we will fall short than the rise to 1,500 that was so considered to be the next uh, target for, from July this year. So for the time being, the resettled the refugees are unable to come to New Zealand and they remain at risk from violence, COVID-19, other diseases that are sometimes very much in rife, are really rife in those temporary camps. 
The question is really whether that may put New Zealand in a difficult position from an international law viewpoint and from a human rights perspective. Now, we want to understand that the discretionary nature of refugee resettlement is in fact for a durable set solution. There is really not a strong idea of a form, firm set of obligations on an international law. In fact, the resettlements really involve the selection transfer of refugees from a state in which they have initially sought protection to a third state that agrees to admit them with a permanent resident status. The actual mechanisms of the resettlement process are very much unregulated by the Refugee Convention. And because it's a discretionary process, this nature, the nature of the resettlement, what does it mean in fact is that there is limited harmonization. Obviously, group, some groups are resettled in priority for by one country, maybe not by another. And if there is sometimes a gap between what the statistics of the UNHCR tell us on who is put forward for resettlement and what really happens in practice. More interestingly, and I'll, and I'll, and I'll finish my, my, my comments on, on this point, is the health concerns that come with COVID-19. These health concerns have been a reason why resettlement has been delayed, suspended, but also because of the stigma that can comes with infectious diseases and now with COVID-19, the fear of contagion, that may affect the willingness of states to resettle refugees. This happened in 2013, 2014, when there was an outbreak of Ebola in, in Africa. A number of resettled refugees were not taken by countries. I think that Australia was one of those countries that suspended humanitarian visas for refugees from Ebola affected countries. So where does it lead us as far as New Zealand is concerned? Well, we have taken up an agreement to take a certain number of resettled refugees. It's kind of a political commitment on our part to follow through on it. It is not a legal commitment under international law, but one that I believe should be honored and hopefully set an example to be followed by others, ensuring that these people who are at risk can find a home in a country where their rights may be respected. Kia ora. thank you very much, Petra. Thank you very much, Alberto. Susie, you uh, need... Yeah. yeah, okay, good. So, building on more of the resolutions of the World Health Organization, New Zealand has supported a resolution, and in fact, two parts of that resolution that I'll summarize really as relating to the pooling of research and the pooling of patents. The two are of course related because research usually supports patents. The two strands this gives to rise to is sharing of all information relating to COVID-19, but specifically patents and patent pooling relates to the sharing of the information that relates to the patent. Now, once something is patented, usually that information is shared through a disclosure system, which is governed by international patent rules. But patent polling really refers to not charging others to license and use those patents. So any patents relating to vaccines are extremely important. This is because it's likely that there will be more than one patent per vaccine, right? So a vaccine can actually give rise to multiple patents. And I won't bore you with all those details, but it does get rather technical. Now, of course, why does this matter? Because whilst there's a lot of disagreement about many things, most of the world agrees that a vaccine is gonna be crucial to solving the pandemic, to actually being able to move internationally, even if our new global looks quite different. Okay, so you, we all know that there's a lot of work afoot around developing vaccines and also treatments. There are several hundred possibilities. Vaccines are quite complicated. Biotechnology's gone a long way, but vaccines remain complicated. And it seems to be particularly complicated with COVID-19 because of its particular protein structure and its ability to put on new disguises but we'll leave the biochemical to the biochemical experts or the biologics really to the biologic experts. But what's important there is to understand that one thing that is very true is that it's quite difficult to develop an effective vaccine. 
it takes a long time. And then there are health and safety concerns whereby clinical trials are very important to vaccines. So it's widely accepted both by pharmaceutical companies and by critics that vaccines are research intensive, resource intensive, manufacturing intensive, and that supply chains for vaccines are really important. So when the World Health Organization has said we must pull patents, it is trying, in a sense, to simplify that process. New Zealand has supported this move, but it's also trying to make the vaccine or vaccines should they emerge available and in the words of the UN resolution fairly and equitably distributed throughout the world. So whilst that sounds very good the same resolution from the World Health Organization refers to matters such as legally upending patents, which is extraordinary language and is the language that gave rise to a number of objections, unsurprisingly led by the United States, to some of this idea of patent pooling. Now, where did the objections come from? Largely from the big pharmaceutical companies. These objections aren't something that we should dismiss very quickly because these pharmaceutical companies are clearly both very important and in many senses leading the way in the research to vaccines and treatments for COVID-19. So what do we do about this competition? The legally upended rules referred to are the rules of the World Trade Organization and the rules of the TRIPS agreement that give essentially private rights over patented inventions. When the World Health Organization first referred to research sharing and so on, the big pharma, big pharmaceutical industries known as big pharma often collectively, came out and said this sharing of research is nonsense. So whilst we know that a lot of scientists are sharing research around the world, big pharma spoke out actively against this. Now what was it that they were saying? They said that if you share research in this way, some research can be shared, sure, fine, but not all research around developing a vaccine is necessarily favourable to share because, and I quote, it removes innovation incentives. Now, anyone who's followed the activities of Big Pharma could have almost written that sentence for them because whenever Big Pharma is faced with a problem, they always tell us that they need proprietary rights and the ability to make a profit because of innovation incentives. The difficulty is, of course, what on earth does that mean? Innovation incentives are extremely important. They feature significantly in debates around pharmaceuticals and patent law because the real question is how much incentive do you need? How much protection and so on. The interesting thing about a difficult pandemic is that with or without patent law, there is an enormous incentive to find a vaccine. That incentive exists regardless, I would say, of patent law because there is a worldwide market. Often patent law will provide innovation incentives as, a, as economists would have it really to address a kind of market failure. Why would certain things be invented? Now, there's even problems with talking about market failure in patent law and that's a very big and debatable point. But here, in the COVID-19 situation, there really is unlikely to ever be any market failure. The real question is, can we serve the market or can any vaccine company serve the market enough? But it's important to note Big Pharma's reaction to that because it plays into its reaction to patent pooling. So whilst Big Pharma has made statements along the line of saying that it will supply the vaccine on a not-for-profit basis, and some of the big pharma companies have made explicit statements, Johnson & Johnson, GlaxoSmithKline, AstraZeneca, which incidentally is the company teamed with the Oxford Research Group, who think that they're going to make a lot of progress, and we've seen a lot about that in the media. All of these entities are saying that they are happy to provide as much access as possible on a not-for-profit basis. So that sounds great, but what does that mean? Not-for-profit does not necessarily mean affordable. Who's going to work out not-for-profit? So not-for-profit essentially means recouping innovation costs, so on, 
and so forth. Well, it's undoubtedly true that the costs of innovation here are large. So what does not-for-profit mean? It doesn't necessarily mean affordable and equitable access for all, as the WHO has said. Now, Big Pharma has a history of not really opening its books to truly reveal what it has cost in order to innovate in a particular field or a particular pharmaceutical. So who's going to measure this not-for-profit? Is it going to be a self-policing matter? These are commercial entities and so on. So we could be optimistic. We could think Big Pharma sees an opportunity here to restore its credibility with the global public. All around the world, there have been questions raised about the unprecedented levels of profit that Big Pharma has. But one can also detail a history where Big Pharma will tell you that they need those profits on blockbuster drugs to, in order to fund quite a few other unprofitable research endeavours. And one can get caught in that argument in perpetuity. I'm inclined to think that if you look at the bottom line profit of these companies, they're some of the most profitable companies in the world. There ought to be a bit more flexibility in there. But even if we accept that they'll supply the vaccine, hopefully they'll invent it on a not-for-profit basis, we have to be cautious about what that really means. But it is really important to note the role of private companies in research. The global and international law framework is to encourage private companies to undertake research right across the health sector. And so much of the public good side of the right to health, of research and so on, is placed in the hands of pharmaceutical companies based on the concept of research innovation. And it is even when this research is publicly funded, Often that's also jointly funded by private entities. So the framework internationally is even though the WHO and its members can support equitable access, the framework actually allows significant private interests to control that access and the supply lines. Medicines Sans Frontiers have actually come out and said that national interests could lead to a scramble for those who can buy the vaccines first. And as unpleasant as and unsightly as that idea is, we've also seen evidence of attempts of that to, to happen for one country or another to corner the market. Sanofi is a different example where they had originally stated, so Sanofi is a French-based pharmaceutical company, originally stated that their first orders would be supplied to the United States. They've since backed off this. But we are seeing an unseemly potential scramble. So... What does this mean? Well, it might mean that a lot of people have to manufacture the vaccine or vaccines when it's created. But to do so, one might have to purchase a license at who knows what price, or one might have to take the WHO legally upend patents and manufacture in any event. And then we see a potential clash of WTO and WHO interests. So this could be Big Pharma's moment. Big Pharma actually, after the Second World War, or in fact, after Pearl Harbor, did collaborate and manufacture penicillin very cheaply and so on in order to supply troops. And by D-Day, they were able to supply 40,000 units of penicillin. Now, that was really significant at the time. It was a global event and Big Pharma came to the party. Maybe they will this time, maybe they will make the vaccine widely available. What's important for New Zealand is its participation in research groups so that it can be as part of the supply chain, or indeed, if it's able to manufacture locally, there is the possibility to build that capacity. But it's really important to remember with all the goodwill in the world of all the WHO statements which I would fully support and the government of New Zealand fully supports about fair and equitable access, the control here really lies in the hands of private interests who will take their investments very seriously and will not be giving this away. Thank you. Thank you very much, Susie. I'm sure that you have raised lots of questions. Um, we will leave the WHO now a little bit and turn more to the C. Jenna. Kia ora koutou. Um, thank you, Petra. 
Last time I talked about the issues facing cruise ships and in particular the legality of port states refusing um, to allow entry into port for cruise ships. This time I want to talk about a slightly different issue um, relating to flags of convenience. I'm also going to make at the end a couple of comments about some developments that have been impacted or potentially influenced by the pandemic. So today I want to talk about flags of convenience. And a number of um, prominent Australian academics, including Professor Stuart Kay, Natalie Klein, Don Rothwell, have been pointing out the problems associated with the fact that cruise ships, which may be based in ports like Melbourne and Sydney, are actually not registered uh, in Australia. In fact, they are registered in a range of jurisdictions from the Netherlands to the Bahamas, the Marshall Islands, Cyprus, and even Malta. Now, under the law of the Sea Convention, every ship must fly the flag with the country to which it is registered. And this so-called flag state has overall responsibility for the ship, including for safety purposes and, and the application of criminal law, etc. So it's quite an important relationship. And under the convention, there is meant to be a genuine link between the flag state and the vessel that's registered with it. However, what a genuine link is, isn't set out in the convention or in international law generally, and so it's left up to each state to decide whether a genuine link has been established. Flags of convenience have developed over the decade in response to increasing regulation and, and responsibilities for flag states. Originally, in the key industrialised countries like the US, the UK, Europe, um, shipping companies registered their ships with the country in which they were based. However, they soon realised that they could save money by registering in other countries, and these were often small developing countries. These smaller countries created what are known as open registries. This meant that the genuine link didn't need to be very strong. Often, those countries imposed far fewer obligations in respect of labour laws, safety rules and other regulations. Therefore, shipping companies transferred their ship registration to those countries because it was more convenient, and therefore we call them flags of convenience. Now, why is this relevant to COVID? Well, the problem arose under COVID when the ports started closing to cruise ships. Um, in some cases, passenger, some passengers or all passengers were allowed to um, disembark in, in big countries or their, their home ports but not in every case. Um, and for many options, um, for many of these cruise ships, um, the only option after those passengers had been disembarked was to consider returning to the port of the flag state because other ports were closing um, the ports to these cruise ships. However, the problem is that these small flag states or flags of convenience weren't equipped logistically to have hundreds of cruise ships headed there all at once. And certainly, if there had been significant outbreaks of COVID-19 on board, their health systems would simply not have been able to cope uh, if, if there was an outbreak on the ship. So this really highlighted a vulnerability in the way that ship registrations have evolved. So recently, uh, some academics have suggested that maybe the, this COVID-19 situation will be a tipping point for flags of convenience. Um, a lot of people have been trying to arguing that we need to get rid of flags of convenience because it has all sorts of implications for law enforcement, um, safety concerns, inadequate environmental controls. Um, but actually the flag of convenience system has proven remarkably robust, even in light of all of these challenges. Um, so it seems, my, it's my view that even though there's been pressure put on these small countries as a result of COVID-19, and we are seeing significant problems caused for the crews, some of which are stuck on board the cruise ships waiting for the pandemic and the port closures to pass, um, I don't think we are going to see a significant change in that system. Um, and this is, I guess, exacerbated by the fact that once the passengers had disembarked, the, the public attention has come off that. So um, much as we'd like to, 
to see flags of convenience perhaps um, waning in light of the COVID-19 pandemic, it's probably unlikely that that's going to happen. Now, I'm just moving on to a couple of other developments. And these are developments, um, I want to mention two things, and they're not so much an impact of COVID on international law, but um, the, the fact that the pandemic exists has had an impact and potentially on state behavior. The first of these is in relation to the South China Sea. Um, and there has been a concern expressed that China is using the distraction caused by COVID-19 to push their claims in the South China Sea and also elsewhere. Now for the South China Sea, if you, if you may be aware that in 2016, an arbitral tribunal ruled that China's claims to exclusive economic zones around small features in the South China Sea were in violation of the Law of the Sea Convention. Now China's refused to accept the jurisdiction or the findings of the tribunal and has persisted in building islands and making excessive claims under the Law of the Sea Convention. Now during the pandemic, uh, China's been continuing to take steps not only in challenging uh, the legitimacy of uh, the coastal state government uh, actions within what most states would consider their legitimate exclusive economic zone. But interestingly, um, in April, China declared the establishment of two new administrative districts in the Spratly and the Parcel Islands. The, Viet the Philippines and Vietnam have objected to the declaration, but Commentators have suggest that, suggested that um, this is probably an attempt to build the case of sovereignty over the features. And the fact that it was declared during the pandemic may simply be um, trying to take advantage, of, you know, that that might, might not be noticed and be objected to. So, um, so this is, I think, an illustration of the fact that while governments are distracted by the pandemic, that, you know, there may be some other governments who might be interested in, in pushing the boundaries in international law. The second example is in relation to negotiations in the United Nations for a new treaty. So for the last couple of years, um, the United Nations General Assembly has authorized um, a new treaty to be negotiated, focused on the conservation and sustainable use of marine biodiversity in areas beyond national jurisdiction, meaning the high seas and the deep seabed. This is known as the BBNJ Treaty, not a particularly wieldy name. Um, so, but however, it's an important treaty. Um, it's designed to fill important gaps in the international law uh, framework um, for, prote for protecting the high seas, which is about 64% of the Earth's surface, but really the regulation is pretty poor. For example, one issue is the how to create a framework for establishing marine protected areas on the high seas. Now, the General Assembly authorised four sessions of negotiations, and the fourth and possibly final session was to have been held in the last week of March and early April. But obviously, it was due to be held in New York and has been postponed due to the pandemic. And we don't yet have any real idea of when those negotiations will resume. And I think it has two interesting um, points, to, there's two interesting points to mention here. First of all, um, obviously in relation to this treaty, any delay is simply um, going to add to the amount of time that it takes to conclude new international law. And really that's not fantastic. First of all, international law takes a long time to negotiate, come into to effect, and there are already quite serious issues facing the oceans. The second um, interesting point is that uh, this raises questions about how states can conduct diplomacy at the time of a pandemic when borders are closed. Now, obviously, some discussions can take place online, as most of us are having to move to doing these days, but it can be pretty difficult if you're trying to do this across time zones. Um, um, also, and I think people often forget this, a major aspect of international negotiations comes in the informal conversations and the networking that take place in the sidelines of international meetings. Often that is an opportunity for diplomats and negotiators to really try and understand each other's positions outside of the more formal posturing that takes place 
on the, the floor of the negotiations. Um, so it's going to be much harder to have those conversations. They'll be less organic if they can't be done in person. So it will be interesting to see um, whether um, diplomacy and negotiations can take place in a, a more, um, in a world that's affected by COVID-19 where um, we're reliant on electronic communications. And hopefully um, we can use the time before the next meeting, whenever it might be, to make some progress in those negotiations. Thank you. Thank you, Jenna. Uh, we're keeping a little bit of as a theme of protected areas and now going to Bjorn to talk about climate change. Thanks a lot, Petra. Um, yes, I want to cover two points today. Uh, so one is climate change and COVID-19, um, the linkages between those two crises, and then talk a little bit about cooperative sovereignty, which I think is a very helpful concept in trying to address some of those underlying issues we as the international community are facing and will be facing in the future more often and more dramatically as well. So. Just very briefly, um, building on what I said in the last session, um, yes, carbon emissions have uh, gone down because of uh, the virus. Um, that's nothing to celebrate because even though it has been uh, quite a dramatic cut in carbon emissions, it's uh, estimated that it'll be around 8% less than last year. Um, it is only temporary, um, not even talking about the hardship and the social implications. It brought with it. Uh, but the worry is that we will see governments ramping up the economies, trying to catch up um, and linking that to international law, um, not really doing what the Paris Agreement on Climate Change was intended to lay out, that states ratchet up the approach in cutting emissions more dramatically as time goes on. So there'll be uh, a very important period now where we will see whether states will take this obligation seriously. Uh, and I'm worried that they won't. And uh, what you can read between the lines in a lot of countries, um, their NDCs, their nationally determined contributions won't be as ambitious as hoped. Uh, and this year is actually the deadline for handing in those updated NDCs and um, it's bad timing, I would argue. Um, another example of showing those links is that the Green Climate Fund, which was uh, set up in 2010, um, where developed countries pledged to contribute 100 billion US dollar to developing nations um, for their uh, climate projects, uh, adaptation projects. Um, less than half of that money has reached developing uh, countries, and that is expected to be further delayed because of COVID-19. So it's not really helpful in terms of addressing the other crisis, uh, which we are all facing. And in addition to that, I think what COVID showed us is that there is this underlying struggle in international law, uh, in particular in international environmental law, where we still have this fight between uh, nationalistic um, ideas of sovereignty and this principle that we have to cooperate. We need cooperation uh, in, in, in times of pandemics, uh, in, in times of protecting the oceans, in, in uh, the climate crisis. So we need to cooperate stronger together, but um, it seems like uh, this crisis has shown that there's a withdrawal from, from a lot of countries uh, back into their nationalistic views. Um, and it'll be interesting to see whether the UK and Italy, they're co-hosting the next conference of the parties uh, of the UNFCCC, the F Framework Convention on Climate Change, whether they will be able to put the nation states back on track to have a stronger multilateral response to climate change um, than what it looks like at the moment. Um, so that links the, the issue of climate change to, to the bigger problem, I think, um, this of interdependence. So we can see this crisis, uh, COVID-19, has really shown us that um, in order to address those challenges, we need to cooperate more. Um, we cannot solve issues like the climate change uh, challenge by just focusing on our nationalistic views. 
Um, but those nationalistic views are not new. They're not linked to COVID-19. States have been more nationalistic in recent years, um, just talking about Brexit or uh, the Trump administration, uh, just a couple of those examples. Um, so how can international law react? How can international law uh, provide the language that is needed to get states back on track to cooperate more? That's the big question I'm interested in. And um, I won't have time to, to go into too much detail today, but hopefully if we have another session, we can discuss it uh, in, in round three as well. Um, but what I want to, to mention is that, well, we need to coordinate our efforts. We realize we cannot do it alone. It's true for so many crises, the environmental crisis, um, Joanna talked about the oceans, massive issues there where cooperation is needed, cybercrime, international terrorism, and of course, pandemics. Um, so that goes against this underlying feeling uh, and perception a lot of people, pundits in international law have that we base our system on state consent. And if states do not consent to doing something or restricting their sovereign rights, um, international law cannot do a lot about it. In many areas, that's the case. Um, so there seems to be this structural uh, bias against effective action on global public goods. And that's something we need to work on as international lawyers. So how can we overcome this problem? How can we create legal frameworks that allow for stronger cooperation, accepting there is this concept of sovereignty, but maybe we have to rethink what sovereignty actually means. Um, so how can we bridge those two massive gaps between knowledge and action and the other gap in action and state responsibility? Uh, and those two questions are, are really uh, important when we talk about climate change or environmental degradation in, in more general terms. Um, and I think what we need to, to do again is to build our frameworks on this idea of common concern. And the climate framework has done that. So if you are familiar with the UNFCCC, the Framework Convention on Climate Change, um, it is written in the, in the preamble that the Earth's climate and its adverse effects are a common concern of humankind. But as you also know, the legal frameworks that build on the UN uh, Framework Convention, they have not achieved a path um, that prevents dangerous climate change from happening. So we're not doing enough to underpin this very important uh, principle um, to protect the, the, the climate system. Um, so how can we move forward? How can we materialize something like common concern? Um, and I think one of those key issues we international lawyers have to uh, put a bit more focus on again is talking about ethics. Um, we always try and sh shy away some, sometimes from talking about ethics. It's not, um, it's, it's not what we like to discuss as lawyers um, in, in, in many cases. But I think questions of equity and solidarity, uh, justice, they have to uh, be discussed with a new approach. Um, and I think this COVID crisis might be able to, to help us take stock, just like it does within national societies, saying, okay, which, what kind of economy do we want? Uh, at the international level, there might be just now this period where we can say, okay, what kind of international community do we want to build? Can we build an international community that uses those established principles of international law, but with a new twist, which can help us build a stronger community after having gone through this crisis, trying to prevent the next crisis from getting out of hand, trying to address the other crisis, climate change, uh, more effectively. Um, so what are those ethical uh, underpinnings that might help us achieve cooperative sovereignty? Uh, and I think one of those key elements that could help uh, would be rethink what solidarity means in international law. Um, so this idea that there are decisions based on equity, um, that uh, a recognition of affinity, um, that we include the others uh, in our solutions. Um, it is a different kind of thinking than 
just my country first in negotiations. Um, and that has to happen. And I think when you go through a crisis, it becomes even more obvious. Um, and in particular, when you know that you have a couple of other crises uh, lined up, which don't go away just because uh, we, we are facing uh, COVID-19 now. Um, so how can we lawyers help support this development? And I think in some areas of international law, we can see traces of solidarity built in. Uh, talking about international disaster law, uh, even international trade law, where you have this, this idea of special and differentiated treatment. And of course, international environmental law, common but differentiated responsibilities. That's one of those stepping stones built in even into the climate uh, system that's supposed to help us achieve uh, what is called cooperative sovereignty. Uh, but we're not there yet. We have to keep building on those stepping stones and develop those um, principles further. Um, so I think, yes, solidarity is a very important um, ethical element we need to, to put more effort on um, in, in terms of solving those global crises. Um, because ultimately what we want to do is build an international community, um, not only an international society, we want to be stronger as a community at the international level. And COVID-19 has shown that we are interconnected, uh, the issues are interconnected, they're linked. Um, and I think it is the time to take stock and say, okay, where are we heading as a group of states and are there ways to move forward even if some of the more powerful states seem to be pulling out as we are seeing now with the US and um, what can international law do to support the ones that want to keep moving forward not being slowed down by those laggard countries um, and those issues I think uh, uh, will be will be key in deciding where we're heading in the future in terms of international law um, so that's it from me for now and uh, looking forward to your questions Petra. Thank you very much and I think you just basically pinpointed I thought one of the themes for me which went through all the presentations and that is you know how are we going to see the international community react and I think I start with you um, Alberto because one of the things we have seen is that yes you said we've seen some solidarity but if we look at how much PPE got lost, you know, on some airports, how many ventilators got stuck and seized by, you know, which were destined for one country, got seized by another country. There is potential for a lot of conflict there as well. So Alberto, what do you think? The, the Security Council has been very quiet. What's the role of the Security Council in all of this and to advance what Bjorn actually has suggested? Thank you very much for the question. Yes, well, I think that the agenda that Bjorn Oliver has set for us, it's, it's very high threshold, but, but cooperation is really the way of the future. And certainly within the WHO, that's what has happened to some extent. But I would say at some, some extent to the other end of the spectrum, you've got the Security Council with binding powers under Chapter 7 of the Charter of the United Nations, who could in fact bypass state consent and take action. But obviously in areas, and especially one of the permanent five, one of the permanent uh, members of the Security Council, uh, his interests are at stake, it can hardly do much work. What is really sad is that we're now in June and the Security Council is still unable to come to a, an agreement and pass a resolution asking for a ceasefire around the world and give the potential impact of COVID-19 on uh, uh, that can take root in ongoing armed conflicts in a variety of settings. Uh, there, even there, the Security Council has been unable to, even though it was able in relation to e Ebola to take some action to favor assistance, cooperation, it has failed to do so. And it is really sad that in a way, certainly procedurally, the Security Council has innovated during this crisis and has been able to meet online and has really been able to, to continue its work despite it's located in New York and where it was, which was hit very hard by the COVID-19. However, I think the, its incapacity to take some action to maybe favor more assistance or has been and to denounce the risk 
uh, of COVID-19, it's really, it's, it is really, it shows the reputation is still stained by real politic and in fact by the specter of an emerging new cold war. We need to be realistic about it. And very sadly that despite what Secretary General Antonio Gutierrez said, depict, how he depicted the COVID-19 as a, unleashing the tsunami of hate and xenophobia, xenophobia, scapegoating and scaremongering, that little can still be expected from the, the, this body, so powerful body, but which is really, unfortunately, it shows that it's more suited to traditional threats to peace and security and unable to work. But by chance, other organs or agencies within the UN have been more active. But the Security Council has really showed an absence of leadership. I mentioned it in the first round. And uh, hopefully by the third round of COVID inter and international law, we'll get to talk about, hopefully, Security Council resolution. Thank you very much. Yeah, Alberto, I wanted to, I wanted to actually stay with one of the Security Council members, and that is China. Uh, Jenna, you know, you have kind of alluded to, or well, the question is what China is doing in the South China Sea. Is that something where they're using the attention of COVID-19 as of elsewhere to establish themselves in the South South China Sea, or is that something like normal behavior for China? Um, thanks, Petra. Um, well, I think observers of China over the last several years have suggested that, or a couple of things in relation to its behavior. Um, some have suggested that China is abandoning a rules-based order, um, which usually is taken to mean international law. Um, but um, others have suggested actually China is trying to rebuild the international um, rules-based order more in its favor because it would argue that it didn't have much of an input into the existing rules-based order. Um, and another observation that's been made has been that China likes to work from, a, from the state, you know, to change the status quo to a point where it can um, reflect its own interests. And because it's a more powerful state than its neighbors, most of its neighbors, it seems to be able to do that. Um, so it's then negotiating from a position of, um, of strength, if you like. And I thought it was very interesting um, that we've recently seen some border skirmishes with India um, and between India and China at this time, um, when of course all, you know, India is, itself is also focused on COVID-19 and, and things like that. So I, I, don't, I think it's probably more of the same in some ways, but that perhaps this moment is being seen as an opportunity um, to, to sort of try, you know, advancing the, the, the approach that China has been trying to take. Thank you, Jenna. Susie, what you were talking about, the vaccine, is probably where we need probably in regard to COVID-19, most of our solidarity, I would think. Um, do you have heard, we have talked you know, about the Security Council, we have talked about China's role. Can you maybe also comment on New Zealand's role regarding you know, this kind of humongous world effort regarding the vac vaccine? Yes, well, we have a vaccine strategy which appears on the MB website, which is very, very, very thin, but I think it's important and perhaps building on the points about China to recognize that the teams that are working on vaccines are spread around the world. And this includes China, of course, one of the leading coronavirus research institutes that has had some profile is actually based in Wuhan and involves US and Chinese researchers collaborating. So we have all these interesting collaborations uh, which cross some borders where there are political divergence. However, state responsibility and state consent has a very difficult problem when in fact what state consent has achieved is handing over the ability to consent or the ability to cooperate over a public health need largely to private interests because we can talk about chinese researchers and we can talk about us researchers but we can also recognize that their governments don't necessarily agree with the actions in both directions of those private groups but the vaccine will likely come out of public private cooperation 
which sits within a framework of state consent that hands it over to that kind of public-private cooperation. And in fact, the same is even true of green technologies within climate change. So one of the challenges really is what that means. In, in the climate change area, and I won't stray too far into that, one of the things that we see is that there are workarounds, right? You can have several different ways to come to a solar panel, for example. One of the challenges with pharmaceuticals and particularly with vaccines is although we're going to have several different ones, the workarounds basically don't exist, partly because of the technical capacity, but also that is the nature of pharmaceuticals. So what, what, what's New Zealand's role in all of this? It's about making sure that we are part of the supply chains and so on that will lead to this. Whilst we do contribute to some of the research, our contribution to that research is so minimal and we may be contributing to a project that doesn't have the first mover advantage, that doesn't create the vaccine first. And then there's a question about even if the vaccine is created, New Zealand's role for New Zealand might be to manufacture locally, but that would also undoubtedly be for supply to the Pacific Islands. But what's more likely to happen is we'll also get supply via Australia. So, you know, it's a complicated question, but I'm always very interested in the international law idea that is summarised by my colleagues of state cooperation, because the state cooperation here is in fact operating a little bit without power. The same is true over the role of the technology companies. And so a lot of state cooperation also has to meet the property problem, right? If you give private entities property, then state cooperation also recognizes that if property is expropriated, even for a very good reason, this can lead to private individual rights and we won't dive down investment arbitration, but that's going to be alive and well here. And so, you know, New Zealand's role in this is really to hope that we are part of the international network that enables us to get medicines and vaccines as efficiently as we often try to do. And international trade has a lot of importance there. So Bien referred to special and differential treatment. Well, that's virtually dead as far as health research cooperation goes. It more or less doesn't exist. So time doesn't permit me to go into that. But the importance of our trade network becomes hugely important here. And so whilst negotiations with the EU for free trade agreements seem a very bizarre thing during COVID-19, that'll be really important if we're going to bring pharmaceuticals from EU inventors. Thank you, Susie. So Björn, you started off this disc our discussion with your, um, you know, your commentary. You have the last word. Um, what's your re reaction to what your colleagues have said and outlined? And do you see that there is like a conflict between the general duty to cooperate with the concept of state sovereignty? Also in light of Susie's comments just now. Yeah, um, thanks. And, and, and thanks for all my colleagues' comments on, on uh, their particular areas of international law, and especially thanks to Susie. I haven't even thought about the links uh, between her research and my research in terms of geoengineering. Uh, you mentioned green technology. Um, so in geoengineering, we, we have a, a fear that countries also outsource their responsibilities and say, okay, we do it. We let private companies uh, fix our, our failures of, uh, of, of uh, reigning in the dangers of climate change. Um, so very, very interesting points from you, Susie. Um, I think what, what we um, should not do is despair and say, well, we're failing on all those fronts. Uh, and, and I think just with the last session, um, it seems like the international law and COVID session is a rather, um, well, pessimistic session compared to our, our national colleagues probably. Um, I think what we should focus on is those sometimes relatively small but still very important elements that are moving into what I consider the right direction in building stronger communities. Um, and I say communities because I think this is a reflection of the world we live in. We don't have this uh, one global framework governing everything. Uh, this idea of global constitutionalism um, as important as it is, uh, we're not there yet. Um, we have, as Alberto mentioned, a highly dysfunctional 
uh, Security Council, which would be the most effective way of dealing with a lot of those issues, but it doesn't deal with those issues appropriately. Um, but still, I think we can, we can find some hope in those small, uh, smaller groups of states where they cooperate in that sense of accepting, yes, we have a responsibility to cooperate. And that is in line with what we understand sovereignty is because it's not this traditional state-centered approach anymore. And New Zealand is one of those countries um, that is trying to do that in some areas. And that's where we build communities on various issues. So you might disagree with one state on, um, on what to do in Syria, but you might agree with how to move forward on climate change. Um, so you build a community with states that want to move forward on those topics and hope that because your way is successful, uh, that other states might, might follow suit and the communities become stronger and bigger as time goes on. Um, so I think, yes, at the, at the moment, we, we see a lot of this dysfunction between um, the concept of state sovereignty and cooperation. But I also see some, some very good developments in some areas um, where we can, can find some, some hope, I think, uh, even in those crazy times we're in at the moment. Thank you very much. And Bjorn, with these words, I thank, I thank my colleagues for this incredibly interesting hour. Um, I hope that in the, the round three, we can see the communities have built even further the progress that has been made in coming together as globally. And with that, uh, I wish everybody a fantastic day.